in the book of Mark chapter 10 this evening. Mark chapter 10, reading from verse 45. From verse 45, continuing a little bit more on the character study series. This is going to be blind Bartimaeus this evening. I get started on these and I can't quit. You get interested in them and they're such a blessing. As Romans 15.4 tells us, you know, that gives us strength and hope. And this incident is recorded for us about 2,000 years ago. Notice beginning in verse 45. It says here, For even the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister, and to give His life a ransom for many. They came to Jericho, and as they went out of Jericho with His disciples, and a great number of people, blind Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, sat by the highway side begging. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. And many charged him that he should hold his peace, but he cried the more great deal, thou son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stood still and commanded him to be called. And they called the blind man, saying unto him, Be of good comfort, rise, he calleth thee. And he, casting away his garment, rose and came to Jesus. And Jesus answered and said unto him, What wilt thou that I should do unto thee? The blind man said unto him, Lord, that I might receive my sight. And Jesus said unto him, Go thy way, thy faith hath made me thee whole. And immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus in the way. Father, again tonight, we ask Your blessings upon the reading of Thy Word. We ask again this evening, Lord, that You would speak to our hearts. And Lord, You've told us in Your Word that these things are written for our hope, our understanding. And Father, we pray tonight that these will be a blessing to us. In Christ Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Bartimaeus, the blind beggar whom Jesus healed and saved by His mercy and His grace. Now, his story is actually recorded in three different places. It's recorded in Matthew chapter 20, verses 29 through 34. And of course, the verses we've just read from verse 46 to 52, here in Mark chapter 10. But it's also recorded in Luke chapter 18, verse 35 through verse 43. Now, his story, again, occurs in these three books. And in Matthew, there are two blind men. But in Mark and Luke, the focus is on one, and the one that is referred to as Bartimaeus. Now, we find here in verse 46, and it says here, And they came to Jericho, and as they went out of Jericho... With his disciples, we find here, and with the number, a great number of people, then we find blind Bartimaeus here sitting on the roadside. Now, Jericho was a beautiful city with palm trees and hanging gardens and rose gardens. It was as like a retreat or paradise, about 15 to 20 miles from Jerusalem, and it, and it was built by Herod the Great. Now, there's two Jerichos mentioned in the Bible. Joshua chapter 2 and verse 1, we have the ancient Jericho that Israel went through as they entered into the promised land, and it was cursed and it lay in ruins today. In Mark chapter 10 and verse 46 and other places in the New Testament, the modern city, I guess we could say, at least in the first century, uh, this is the Jericho that Jesus went to. Now, there's Bible critics with many things throughout the Scriptures. And in the, in the past, we've spent a few sermons speaking on some of those. But the critics say that there is a discrepancy between Matthew and Mark and Luke when it comes to Jericho 
and Jesus entering in and leaving. And they, and, and we've got, uh, one of the passages that says that, uh, as he's entering in, the blind man is sitting there on the road and our text here as he's leaving, you know, the blind man is sitting there. And that doesn't bother me. But the critics will take issue with this. And one writer, his answer were, or was, you have the old Jericho and the new, and he's leaving the old and entering in to the new. And I've never spent any time, I have on other issues, other Bibles, or other Bible verses that seem to contradict, but I've not really spent any time on this, but uh, this is not an issue with me. It's not a discrepancy. Now, in verse 46, this is the Lord Jesus' last trip to Jericho on His way to Jerusalem. He and His disciples and a great crowd are coming through Jericho, headed toward Jerusalem where that He would die on the cross. It's the time of the Passover, so there's a lot of people traveling to Jerusalem And again in verse 46, notice here as we come here again, he says in verse 46, he says, And they they came to Jericho as they went out of Jericho with his disciples and a great number of people. Then we see blind Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, sat by the highway side begging. So here we find that first of all, I'm just kind of got three brief thoughts this evening with this. First of all, we see in verse 46 that he is a poor, blind beggar on the side of the road, probably, possibly with a cup or a garment in his hand where he could collect coins or whatever that anyone would give unto him. He's pleading with the people for help. Now, in this time and day in the first century in, in, in uh, Israel, there was no welfare, uh, as we would see in our country, that people can get help. Obviously, this man is helpless. He probably cannot work. He is blind. He's begging. He is unable to provide for himself. And as we read this story... Uh, there's a there's a picture here of our spiritual condition. Because this man is not only healed physically, but he is healed spiritually. He come he comes to the place of becoming a disciple, a follower of Jesus Christ. But he's unable to provide for himself. And so people would be traveling the road from Jericho to Jerusalem on probably a regular basis, but especially during the time of Passover, literally thousands are working their way to Jerusalem. It was required that the males uh, would go to Jerusalem to worship during this time. Now, the Bible has a whole lot to say about the poor. If you want just a few references, and there's many, In Psalms 34, verses 6 and verse 18, we find that the Lord even says in the New Testament that the poor will always be with you. And that's true. We have those that are poor in the world today. James chapter 2 and verses 1 through 8, the Lord clearly tells us not to have respect of persons. In other words, not treat someone is wealthy better than we would treat someone that is poor. And in the context, is someone that would come in to the congregation and you giving one a good seat and the other one not so good. And so he, he says that we're not to have respect of persons because the Lord Jesus did not have respect of persons. He speaks about the poor man there in James 2 with a vile raiment, that is probably the dirty or worn raiment. He goes on to say in verse 5, he said, Hearken, my beloved brethren, hath not God chosen the poor of this world rich in faith 
and heirs of the kingdom which He had promised to them that love Him. But you have despised the poor. Do not rich men oppress you and draw you before the judgment seat? Do not they blaspheme the worthy name by the which ye are called? And He says, And if you fulfill the royal law according to the Scripture, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. And He says, You do well. But if you have respect of persons, you commit sin and are convinced of the law as transgressors. And that's just two passages. There's a multitude of passages, Old and New Testament, where that we are to protect and help and minister unto those who are truly needed, needy. Now, Jesus had great compassion on this poor beggar, this poor blind beggar. And again, we see, first of all, his desperate need. He's in need of physical healing. I mean, he can't even work and travel around by himself. And he's in need of salvation. And so, I want you to notice now, in verse 47 and 48, we see his incredible faith. He's heard about the Messiah. He evidently knows something about the Scripture. And so, he he's heard about Jesus of Nazareth. And uh, here he gets to meet Him. Notice in verse 47 and 48. It says, And when He heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, He began to cry out and say, Jesus, Thou Son of David, have mercy on me. And many charged Him that He should hold His peace. But He cried the more a great deal, Thou Son of David, have mercy on me. We see here a a incredible faith. Uh, when it says here in verse 47 that he had heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he would have heard of Jesus and his miracles before this event, knowing the promises of the Old Testament Scripture. As a matter of fact, when the Messiah would come, he would be coming performing miracles. As a matter of fact, uh, I want you to listen to this in Matthew 11. You can turn there if you want. In Matthew 11, listen to what John the Baptist had said. Now, there's many verses in the Bible that speak of the Messiah. When He come, they would know who that He was if, if they had faith. Because His miracles were literally proof that He was the Messiah, and Bartimaeus believed this. He's heard of this Messiah that lines up with the Scripture. In Isaiah 35, the first four verses, speaks of of Messiah coming and His miracles. Isaiah 42, verses 1-8, through speaks of Christ as the servant and the covenant and the miracles that He would perform. And the Lord Jesus actually quotes from Isaiah chapter 61, verse 1, 2, and 3, in his first recorded uh, sermon, when he uh, speaks according to Luke chapter 4, in verse 18, it says, "In the spirit, he goes into a synagogue, and uh, he stands up to speak, opens the book of Isaiah, and, and uh, he's, again, he's quoting for what we know now, Isaiah 61. And he says in verse 18, he said, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Because He has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. Now, all can be saved, and they are rich people that have gotten saved. But we'll see later, it's harder for a rich person to enter into the kingdom of God. Because we have to humble ourselves and trust and receive and realize that we're spiritually bankrupt before God. And it's hard for some people to do that. But he says also, he, and he sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and the recovering of sight to the blind, and set at liberty them that are bruised. This blind man would have heard of this, would have heard of Jesus of Nazareth. And again, there were two that are sitting, uh, sitting there, and, um, and it may have been many more, but there's two that are mentioned in Matthew. But uh, but we find here 
that uh, that he had heard this. Now, um, in Matthew chapter 11, in Matthew chapter 11, reading from verse 1, And it came to pass, when Jesus had made an end of commanding his twelve disciples, he departed thence to teach and to preach in their cities. Now, when John had heard in the prison the works of Christ, he sent two of his disciples. Notice this now. And and said unto him, Art thou he that should come, or do we look for another? Jesus answered and said unto them, Go and show John again those things which you have heard, which you do hear and see. Now watch this. The blind receive their sight, and the lame walk. The lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear, and the dead are raised up, and the poor have the gospel preached to them, and blessed is he whosoever shall not be offended in me. So this would be the thing that blind Bartimaeus had heard, uh, the, the teachings of Jesus, the miracles of Jesus, and all of this lines up with prophetic Scripture. Now coming back to Mark, there's something else I want you to notice here in this. Again, we see his incredible faith. When he hears that Jesus is coming through Jericho, we find that he gets excited about that. And there are those who charged or commanded him to shut up. Another, who knows what they were saying? They may have been saying, who do you think you are? You're just a poor blind beggar. You're nobody. And Jesus doesn't have time for you. But I want you to notice as we read verse 47 and 48 again. He says here, And when he had heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. Notice that many charged him that he should hold his peace. Notice they're, they're rebuking him. They're, they're challenging him commanding him to just be quiet. And what does it say? He said, but he cried the more, a great deal, thou son of David, have mercy on me. Now here's another another interesting thing. Not only had he heard of Jesus of Nazareth, but he also knew something about the Scripture that Jesus of Nazareth that would come, the Messiah, that he would be of the lineage of David. He would be a descendant of David. And so he identifies Jesus of Nazareth, this blind beggar. He identifies Jesus of Nazareth as the son of David twice in our text. Now, when we talk about the son of David, this is a royal title appears about 15 times in, in, the, in, in the gospel. And this royal title identifies him as Messiah who was promised under the Old Testament covenant, or I should say not just the Old Testament covenant, the Davidic covenant. And write down 2 Samuel 7, verses 10 through 17. We find that there was a covenant that was made with David and it's, it's centered around David's seed. And it went far beyond Solomon. It, it was, all of these things were fulfilled in David's greater seed. And it centered around his throne. And it centered around his kingdom. And I want you to just turn with me for a moment to the book of um, Psalms. You see, all things were fulfilled in the Lord Jesus Christ. So we have a beggar, a blind beggar, that, that recognizes Jesus of Nazareth, but he is the son of David. Notice in Psalms 89, there's many places that we see this. We see the angel telling Mary, the mother of Jesus, in Luke chapter uh, 1, verse 32 through 33, that this child would sit upon the throne of David and reign forever and ever. Romans 1.13, the fact that he's a descendant of David, is in the gospel message. There would be no gospel if he was not a descendant of David. And Revelation 22, 
16, the root and offspring of David. Now, I have preached a number of messages in this church that have a connection with David. These are the ones I can think of in the last 31 or 31 and a half years. The Davidic Covenant, we have a sermon on that. We also have a sermon uh, on the throne of David. We also have a sermon on the tabernacle of David in Acts 15. The tabernacle of David, according to Peter, Paul, and James, is the church of Jesus Christ that he is building. God promised David that he would build a tabernacle. I have a message titled, The Sure Mercies of David, in Acts chapter 13. And I have another sermon titled, The Key of David. I sat down yesterday and wrote these down. That's in Revelation 3.7. There's some others, but I can't remember what they are. So, David played a great role in Israel's history and the promises. We have the Mosaic Covenant, the Abraham Covenant. We have the Davidic Covenant. And so all of these are important. In Matthew 22, verse 41 through 46, which is a quotation that comes from Psalms 110, verse 1, we find that David's, that Jesus Christ was David's Lord and at the same time David's son. And Psalms 110 was written by David. David had an offspring that was his creator. Now, we understand that, do we not? Because we believe in the divinity and also the humanity of the Lord Jesus Christ that He took upon human flesh. So we see how that can be. But in Psalms 89, just to skip around just a few verses here, go back and read the chapter uh, later. Psalms 89, verse 3 and 4, says, I have made a covenant with my chosen... I have sworn unto David my servant, thy seed will I establish forever and build up thy throne to all generations. Come down with me to verse 20. In verse 20, I have found David my servant with my holy oil have I anointed him. Notice beginning in verse 28. My mercy will I keep for him forever. And my covenant shall stand fast with him. His seed, and this would be Christ, the ultimate seed. His seed also will I make to endure forever in his throne as the days of heaven. If his children forsake my law and walk not in my judgments, if they break my statutes and keep not my commandments, then will I visit their transgression with a rod and their iniquity with stripes. Nevertheless, my loving kindness will I not utterly take from him nor suffer my faithful to fail. My covenant will I not break, nor alter the thing that is gone out of my lips. Once have I sworn by my holiness that I will not lie unto David. His seed shall endure forever, and his throne as the sun before me. It shall be established forever as the moon and as a faithful witness in heaven. These the promises to David. Now come back to our text in the book of Mark. And notice with me now as we come to verse 48 again. He cries out in verse 47 and verse 48, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. Lamentations 3, 22 and 23 speaks of God's mercy. That is His compassion, His pity. He's not crying for justice. He's crying for mercy. And verse 48, again, many charged Him that He should hold His peace. But He cried the more a great deal, Thou Son of David, have mercy on me. They're rebuking Him. It's almost like a threat. You know, shut your mouth. Don't be saying anything. You're not even worthy to be talking at this time. But you find here that he was not ashamed of the Lord. He was not fearful of man. There was no obstacle that would stop him in his endeavor to meet the Savior. 
And you know what? We probably all could give this testimony. When I came to Saving Faith in 1972, I'll promise you this, nothing could stop me. Not even 2,000 sailors on an aircraft carrier that I was worked with, and most of them were lost. Not all of them. But nothing could stop me when I came to the place and cried out and begged for mercy from God. I saw to it that I went to the Lord Jesus. That's what this man is doing. Nobody could stop him. Nobody could stop him. I didn't let the others um, around me who were, you know, uh, who some of them were blasphemous, not all of them. Some were blasphemous and whatever, and they would make fun of Christians. I never let any of that stop me. And they all got witness to in the next couple of years after that, and some of them came to saving faith in Jesus Christ. In verse 49, I want you to notice that it says here, And Jesus stood still and commanded him to be called. And they called the blind man, saying unto him, Be of good cheer, rise, and he, he calleth thee. They had to change their mind, didn't they? They have to be kind to him now, because Jesus is kind to him. And Jesus stood still. Think about, just think, meditate on this a bit. One cry from a large crowd. This is a large crowd. One cry from a large crowd. Man that doesn't have any money. He can't see. He can't walk. He can't find Jesus if he was in the crowd looking for him. Sitting on the road begging. And Jesus stopped everything to take notice of this one voice that cried out from the crowd. And He'll take notice of our voice when we cry out unto Him, not only in salvation, but also any day we come before Him. I believe that when we cry out unto Him, I believe it's not exactly this way, but it's almost like as He sits on His throne that the universe just stops for a moment and He listens to our cry. He stopped everything They're walking, they're traveling, there's a crowd, they're on their way to Jerusalem. His face is set to go to Jerusalem to die for the sins of the world. And one cry from a beggar, and the Lord Jesus stopped everything. He just stopped and called for the beggar to come to Him. He's still doing that today. And so he was. we find here that when we call, He hears us. We have His attention. That's what I want to get across here. And He has time for us. Most people don't have time for you. You know, they don't have time for you to sit down and talk with you or help or minister. But He has time for us. And in Hebrews 4, verse 14 through 16, we have access to the throne of God through Jesus Christ, our High Priest. Anytime we need mercy and grace, We have access to that. And the Lord just stopped everything. He stopped this procession for one blind beggar. Now notice as we read in verse 50. And Jesus stood still. Well, I'm in verse 49 first. And Jesus stood still and commanded him to be called. Now come down to verse 50. And he, casting away his garments, rose and came to Jesus. Casting away his garments, his outer garments. He he wasn't naked. You know, it it was his cloak. And uh, he did not let anything hinder him from coming to Christ. Not even tripping over his robes or his garments or his cloak or whatever. He responded to the invitation. Kind of reminds me of Jacob. In Genesis chapter 32, when Jacob encountered the Lord and he needed help, he was desperate as this blind man, and uh, he would not turn loose of the angelic being. He fought and wrestled all night. He would not turn loose. Now notice in verse 51, And Jesus answered and said unto him, What wilt thou that I should do unto thee? And the blind man said unto him, Lord that I might receive my sight. 
we find here in, in this passage that this is the voice of the Savior. What can I do for you? And he asked this question in order to be able to help him. And he's willing to help. And notice now as we come to verse 52. In verse 52, and this is our last thought, is that I want you to see in this passage, not only is he saved, but he follows Christ. He becomes a model disciple. Verse 52, And Jesus said unto him, Go thy way, thy faith hath made thee whole. Now again, I believe he was made whole physically, and I believe that he was made whole spiritually. And he goes on to say, And immediately he received his sight, and it says here, And followed Jesus in the way. If you compare Luke 18, it says he went and glorified Christ. So he joins in with them on this march to Jerusalem, and he becomes a follower of Jesus Christ. So this is really an amazing story. And I want you to just take just a few of the verses. Notice in Mark, I'm backing up to chapter 8, and notice as we read from verse 34. I want you to notice what true discipleship really is. This man became a disciple. He became a disciple and followed Jesus to Jerusalem. He did not go away. He did not go somewhere else. He became a follower. Notice true discipleship here in this passage. When we talk about true discipleship, it has to do with denying self, taking up the cross, and following Christ. Beginning in verse 34. And when he had called the people unto him and with his disciples, also he said unto them, Whosoever will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it, but whosoever shall lose his life for my sake and the gospels, the same shall save it. For what shall it profit a man if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Whosoever therefore shall be ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him also shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he cometh in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. We see here in these verses, we got sermons on discipleship. We just touched on it just two weeks ago. But the Savior here, according to verse, these verses, and especially verse 34, the Savior is to be put above all others, even ourself. And not only that, we are to confess Him openly, not to be ashamed of Him. And we are to live sacrificially, according to this text, renouncing all worldly pursuits. doesn't mean we can't make a living and all of that and work. We're commanded to do so. But we're to keep a good perspective on what it means to be saved and to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. Back up with me, or go over with me to Mark chapter 10. I want to read here. And then just a few other places and we'll close. But notice in Mark chapter 10. And I'll give you an an example of this and what we just found in Mark chapter 8. In Mark chapter 10, I want to begin reading in verse 17. And when he was gone forth into the way, there came one running and kneeled to him and asked him, Good Master, what shall... I do that I may inherit eternal life. Jesus said to them, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, that is God. Thou knowest the commandments, do not commit adultery, do not kill, do not steal, do not bear false witness, defraud not, honor thy father and thy mother. And he answered and said to him, Master, all these things I observe from my youth. Then Jesus, beholding him, loved him. Notice Jesus loved him. But Jesus also knew his heart 
And he knew the one thing that was keeping him from the Lord. And in this case, it was riches. Some other person, it might be alcohol. Some other person, it may be something else. And he said unto him, One thing thou lackest, go thy way, sell whatsoever thou hast, and give to the poor. Thou shalt have treasures in heaven, and come and take up the cross and follow me. Now we know giving away money doesn't save us, but the Lord knows the heart. You and I don't see the heart. But the Lord could see the heart. He knew the one thing, the one thing, nothing else but this one thing that was keeping him from the Lord. Verse 22, and he, and he was sad at the saying and went away grieved for he had great possessions. And Jesus looked round about and saith unto his disciples, how hardly shall they that have riches enter into the kingdom of God. Now we all know why, don't we? It doesn't take long to figure that out. It's so easy to trust in the things that we have. It's even so easy to even trust beyond riches, even good health. You know, when you really got good health, it's so easy to be thinking, you know, boy, I'm, I'm, I'm okay. And, you know, I'm kind of, you know, I'm, I'm invincible or whatever, but that can change real quickly. And it's so easy for us to have the security in the things that we possess. And this is what the Lord is dealing with. We have to have things to live in this world. But he says here, how hardly, the middle part of verse 23, shall they that have riches enter into the kingdom of God. Verse 24, the disciples were astonished at his words, but Jesus answered again and saith unto them, Children, how hard is it for them that trust in riches to enter into the kingdom of God? It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a, of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. Now, I may not understand this, but if I do understand what a camel is, I think I do, and I understand what the eye of a needle is, even a big needle is still small and compared to a camel, this is impossible. And then we find, verse 26, and they were astonished out of measure, saying among themselves, who then can be saved? Well, that'd be my question too if I was with them. And Jesus, looking upon them, saith, With men it is impossible, but not with God, with God. For with God all things are impossible. God can change the hearts of individuals. But this man walked away. He walked away from the Lord because he had great riches and he trusted in those riches. Well, notice, notice as we come to John chapter 8, I'm going to read just a couple other passages. John chapter 8, then John, I'll just mention John 6 and we'll close in John 10. John 6, verse 60 through 71, I think we read that verse last week in another sermon. We find that many supposed disciples did not continue to follow the Lord Jesus when he said, we, yeah, last Sunday night we read it, when you must eat of my flesh and drink of my blood. John chapter 8, talking about true discipleship. John 8, verse 31 and 32. It says here, well, thir yes, 31 and 32. Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, If you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Turn with me to John chapter 10. We see what true discipleship is. Now notice in John 10, I'm going to close here in this passage. I want to begin reading. I want to begin reading in verse 22. And it was at Jerusalem the feast of the dedication, and it was winter. And Jesus walked in the temple in Solomon's porch. Then came the Jews round about him and said unto him, How long doth thou make us to doubt? If thou be the Christ, tell us plainly. Jesus answered them, I told you, and you believe not. The works. Remember? Blind Bartimaeus, he had heard of Jesus in Nazareth. 
And he knew that Jesus of Nazareth was the Son of God because of the Scripture and because that he would come not only proclaiming that he was the Messiah, but his works, his miracles would prove that. He says here, The works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. Verse 26. But ye believe them not, because ye are not of my sheep, as I said unto you. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father which gave them me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. I want to back up to one verse. All of this is important. But clearly he said, there are those of you who are not of my fold, of not of my sheep. But some were. We know that we belong to God. We know that God's people belong unto Him because of verse 27. We ever want to ask, who is truly born again? Verse 27 answers that. We read verses this morning in Watching and Waiting that answers that. But verse 27 answers, there's a three fold thought in verse 27. And I have a sermon just on this verse a number of years ago. Notice the three things. First of all, he said, my sheep hear my voice. In other words, they believe his words. The second thing he said, he says, and I know them. He knows who belongs to him. And thirdly, as we read about blind Bartimaeus, it says here, and they follow me. That's what we see. That's what we see in Mark 8, Mark 10, Mark, and, 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 and other places. That's what we see. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. Would you stand with me? Let's go to the Lord in prayer. I was just looking back here to our text, and there was one passage that I had turned to that I thought I might have given you a wrong reference, but no, I think I gave you all correctly. I thought I had one wrong. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank Thee tonight for this day that You've given us privilege that you've given us to come together. And Lord, help us to glean from the truths of thy word. Lord, help us to look at these examples that you've given to us. You've recorded these for us 2,000 years later that we can be blessed by this blind beggar that you received unto yourself Healed him spiritually and physically. Lord, help us to learn from these things. We ask all of these things in Jesus Christ, and we pray. Amen.